I want you to cast your mind back nearly a decade. It's May of 2014. Billy Crystal is hosting the annual Jazz at Lincoln Center Gala, and he starts to talk about how musicians were traditionally discovered in the jazz ecosystem. You know, there's always been this sort of mysterious kind of jazz grapevine. Back in the day, Billy says, if you didn't have a chance to see a musician live and in person, you'd discover them on the credits of an album, or maybe you'd read something in the small but crucial jazz press. Or, as was so often the case, you'd get your news the old-fashioned way. Word of mouth. Today, as Billy was explaining, things have changed. Now you can see somebody instantly on the web. A young talent from any corner of the globe can hone their craft in near isolation with just an internet connection and an interest in learning. And that same young talent can become an international sensation overnight. And this young man I'm going to introduce to you is like tearing up the web. He's here from Jakarta, Indonesia. He then introduced a young musician who had recently been discovered on YouTube. He's 10 years old. A very young musician who had been discovered on YouTube. Everyone watches him. Who was making his U.S. debut on one of the most prestigious stages possible after having stunned pretty much anyone who watched him play online. Get ready for this young man. Billy said it. He said it again. And he said it again. And he tried to prepare the audience for what they were about to see. And he's going to play one of the more difficult pieces to play. Thelonious Monk and Cootie Williams, Round Midnight. Then he said a name. Please welcome a really inspirational young man, incredible talent. That would begin to echo almost immediately after it was spoken. Joey Alexander. A little boy, 10 years old, wearing glasses and a white sport coat, walked briskly out on stage, sat down at the piano, and began to play. Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Music has the capacity to reach inside some people from an extremely early age and transform them. Or maybe the music is already inside them and it's just a question of finding and uncovering something that was there to begin with. In any case, the musical prodigy is not a new thing. But when it comes to playing jazz or improvised music or composing, creating, prodigies are a little harder to come by because the music requires maturity some experience outside of the practice room, a point of view, a larger sense of the greater world. At least, I think it does. Then again, drummer Tony Williams famously began his career when he was 14. Pianist Aaron Parks, guitarist Julian Lage, and polymath musician Jacob Collier, all former guests of this podcast, were making credible, even incredible music in their early teens. So Joey Alexander was not the first. But I do think he was just younger, young enough that it kind of freaked people out. And also, unlike Tony Williams, who grew up in Boston, or even Jacob Collier, who grew up outside of London, this kid was from Indonesia. This was not a musical language that he would have heard outside of his house, where his parents played him records. In fact, Joey was born in Bali. He only moved to Jakarta when it was clear to his parents that he needed to have a greater exposure and meet other musicians, and they made that move when he was seven or eight years old. Seeing Joey Alexander play such sophisticated music at such a young age seemed to speak to the potential in all of us. It had a kind of mystical quality about it to me. A year later, a now 12-year-old Joey had recorded his first album called My Favorite Things, and he had moved once again along with his parents to the States to pursue his career. That summer, in 2015, everywhere I went, it seemed like people were talking about him, thinking about him, trying to make sense of it, put it in context, figure out what it means for the economy and the ecology of the music now. I went to the Copenhagen Jazz Festival in July of that year, and I remember having a conversation with the great pianist and educator Kenny Barron, who brought Joey's name up while we were talking. This young kid is uh, everybody's talking about now. Joey Alexander? Yeah, yeah. And he plays great, you know. My, my only thing is that uh, he's going to be a star before you can really learn anything, you know. Well, he's not going to be able to serve any kind of apprenticeship, you know, working for somebody else. So, but, uh, you know, hopefully he'll uh, have his head on straight. That's the main thing. How important do you think it is to work as a sideman before you become a leader? I think it's important, you know. I mean, you're almost forced to be a band leader today, though, <laughs> because of the, the economic situation back there. There, are, there aren't a lot of bands you know, so you're kind of forced to create your own situations. So, you know, I, I can't argue with that. <laughs> this is a question of getting some experience under your belt before you really jump out there. You know. <laughs> a month later, I went to the Newport Jazz Festival to cover it with my dad, and we saw Joey play for the first time there. He played duo with the bass player Russell Hall. 
And we also saw all the other musicians around him dealing with it, processing it, making some kind of sense of it. At that time, I was still fixated on what it could mean that such a young person from so far away could have figured out so much music on his own with almost no guidance and have a sound and identity already. I thought of him kind of as the Dalai Lama of jazz. As we drove away from Newport, my dad and I recorded a conversation about our impressions of having seen Joey. And listening back to it today helps to put his arrival onto the scene into some kind of perspective. Not just in jazz, in any part of life, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that. I don't think it's been seen. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's seen in, in science and mathematics. Bobby Fisher. Bobby Fisher, or kids who graduate from MIT with a PhD when they're 19 years old or something. I don't know. But there's no explanation for how a seven-year-old kid in Indonesia has uh, mastered what what he's 12 now. Yeah, but he's only been playing for five years. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Some people are saying to me, you know, I worry about what's happening to the kid. Well, we're in show business. He is in show business. Yes. It's not like you get to develop as a performer aside from the world of show business. Yes. Well, the only way for him to do what he does is on a stage. And, I mean, by definition, if you're 12 years old and play that well, you're a freak. So, oh man, I, it's beyond freak. It's it feels messiah-like to me, man. Yeah, I it know. Really does it feels mess? Everybody is cautiously talking about it. I mean, I know I keep harping on it, but I love after he played a set and all these musicians were going up to each other and hugging one another and saying, "Well, it's been, been nice, nice playing with you while I was a professional musician." <laughs> it's been nice being a professional musician, yeah. but it does sort of make make you kind of want to like take off your costume, take off your stage stage makeup and go, okay, well, uh, okay. I'll be over here. I'll be at the bar, man. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. If you stick around long enough, even the youngest kids grow up. Today, Joey Alexander is 20 years old and releasing his seventh album called Continuance. Since first emerging in 2014, he spent nearly a decade performing, touring, and recording. He performed with Esperanza Spaulding and Wayne Shorter at the Obama White House. He recorded with Kendrick Scott, Ulysses Owens, Larry Grenadier, Russell Hall, Chris Potter, and more. And although he's been regarded as a skilled pianist and thoughtful improviser, Continuance presents him primarily as a composer of haunting chamber jazz who leads his own ensemble with his own point of view. He made it with his long-standing touring band, Chris Fun on upright bass and John Davis on drums, and with trumpeter Theo Croker on four of the tracks as well, including this, the album's opening song, Blue. We spoke recently about his journey out of Bali and onto the bandstand, what it was like for him to be thrust into the limelight at such a young age, and what he hopes for the future. Third-Story.com is the place to go to sign up and subscribe. Visit the archive. Hundreds of conversations like this one, including the aforementioned episodes with Aaron Parks, Julian Lodge, and Jacob Collier. Plus talks with other pianists like John Batiste, Jason Moran, Fred Hirsch, Kenny Werner, Corey Henry, Larry Golding, Spike Wilner, Emmett Cohen, John Modeski, Vijay Iyer, George Ween. Yeah, he played piano. And Ben Sidron, my dad. And I dare say those are not all of them. Because, in fact, the third story launched onto the scene in early 2014, just a matter of weeks before Joey Alexander walked onto that stage at the Jazz at Lincoln Center Gala. Patreon.com slash Third Story Podcast will keep our internet bill paid so we can stay on top of the latest trends. And, of course, we are made in partnership with WBGO Studios. Visit WBGO.org slash studios to find out more about all their award-winning content. Here's me and Joey Alexander talking it down. Leo, right? Yeah, Leo. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Joey. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me on your uh, show. Yeah, man, thanks for taking time. Are you in a place where you can hang out comfortably for a little while? Yeah, yeah this is good. Great. I'm actually currently in Napa. <laughs> Napa, you know, Napa Valley. Where do you live most of the time? Oh, was home? Uh, 
I'm based on the East Coast, so before you know, like Baltimore, and I'm still living in the Maryland area. You know, still on the East Coast. Do you go back to Indonesia? How often do you go back to Indonesia? Oh, actually, I just not too long ago. Recently, I just came back from Bali. You, but your whole family is in the states with you. Yeah, I just I don't even know this. We always travel as. You've always traveled with your family. Yeah, ever since I started my career, you know, basically like how I say they're responsible, you know, for my you know development upbringing, and so we're you know we're a team. Yeah. Even though what people see, you know, is me, you know, being young, but my parents have always been, you know, there for me to take care, of. not just me, but also kind of the business side of things. Do you have siblings? Yes, I do. Uh, I have a brother. He's well, he's married. He's like 15 years older. You know the difference. Yeah, we're close. Even though we didn't grow up together, but yeah, we're pretty close. So, Joe, you grew up. Listening to music in your parents' house, your parents were always supportive of you, but they also obviously exposed you to music early. What was the music that they played for you when you were a little kid? It varies. You know, there was different kinds of music. And so they would play me, of course, jazz, but also a little bit of pop, like Michael Jackson, James Bond, Whitney Houston or Eddie Van Halen, or Rita Franklin, all of those artists. And so, yeah, there was always music in the house. I could just tap my feet into it. I just felt, you know, music had a connection with me. And of course, the music, jazz, because from, because my parents started taking me to see live shows, and most of them were jazz musicians, and so I was drawn into what they were doing on the bandstand, not musically, but more as if this musical conversation they were having, that was pretty special. You know, it was, that to me was something that I wanted to do to connect with people to music. And I thought, you know, jazz was, can give me that platform, was that platform for me to, a fine uh, connection with people to music, and uh, that's what I saw in jazz. What kind of jazz concerts did you see in Bali? Did you see people on tour, or were they local musicians? Uh, most of them were local, local musicians. Most of the shows that I see, you know, were like jam sessions, and so sometimes people from Europe or even U.S. because Bali is very is an international place basically so musicians overseas will come and sit in with the local musicians so that sometimes that, that will happen and so i guess my parents never thought they would be where i am today playing or performing making you know, having music as my life or making a living out of music <laughs> And of course, I'm grateful that I did, but I never, I guess I never really see that at first. But it's just, you know, as parents, you know, they want to expose me to, to the arts and to music. And I'm grateful for that. Did you take music lessons? Uh, I can say, yeah, I did. I did a few lessons. Like my, my dad would call a musician and just teach me a song, basically a song or two. And that's kind of my educational uh, process. But most of my education was by playing with people, you know, listening and learning to uh, listen to what others are playing. But I didn't really have one teacher. Uh, but I, I guess I can say I learned from everybody. So my dad would call up a musician to come to our place and just, you know, show me something. Mostly are like songs, just yeah. like standards, just to get me to understand the history of the music. So it's more of understanding than just the playing part, but understanding of what that song is about and what I'm playing is more of philosophy stuff that uh, you know that they 
out in me, what I call it, implement uh, in, in me as I learn jazz. And your family, as you became more and more clearly devoted to music, they gave up their original business and home and you all moved to Jakarta to be closer to more musicians? Yeah, it was a big decision you know, for the move. They were not sure where this was going, basically. Uh, but I guess they, you know, I always tell people, you know, this is a gift from God, like a revelation, I would say, that it has brought me here is by God's grace. And I'm, you know, thankful for the gift. And I think they believe that as long as I really stick with it and be better, and my, you know, craft, you know, I think this could go somewhere. You know, it can take me to so many uh, places that I never thought I could go you know, because mm-hmm. of music. Uh, I never thought I would, you know, be here, like, to live in the U.S. and play with so many amazing musicians. And so I, I guess it was fate that kind of, you know, kept us going. And, it, yeah, it was a big move. I guess that's all I'm trying to say. It was a big decision for my parents to sell their you know, tourism business. They did uh, tourism and you know, back in Bali and in Jakarta, it was basically all focusing on me, invested <laughs> in me just to have me, you know, get to know a little bit of the music scene in Jakarta because there was a little bit more musicians in Jakarta. And yeah, there were, you know, professionals, basically. Yeah. So I got to uh, immerse myself to the music scene uh, in Jakarta. And what was that like? I mean, at that point, were you playing gigs? Did you start to play, perform professionally when you moved to Jakarta? Uh, not at first. <laughs> because how old were you? Eight years old or something? Yeah, right. I was eight <laughs> at that time. Uh, so I wasn't making a living out of music yet, but... Later on, you know, as I play with different musicians, they started to take me to gigs. And yeah, yeah I started to perform professionally. Yeah, I started to perform at jazz festivals. And I guess not too many people know this, but my big break was performing at this competition, but also music festival. Uh, it was called Master Jam Fest, which happened in uh, Odessa, Ukraine. And... So there was, I wouldn't say there's a paying gig, but it was more just the experience, you know, getting to know musicians from other parts of the world that I wouldn't, you know, get to see in Indonesia. So it was more for the experience for me to play with other musicians who are not from Indonesia and see what, what the world has to offer, meaning I would say, you know, that jazz is, was larger than life, you know, it was, it has really reached to so many parts of the, the world. And so it was good for me to see what other musicians were doing. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, that in fact, your first international exposure to jazz outside of your home was not in New York or the United States, but it was traveling to other places in the world and interacting with jazz musicians from other parts of the world. And maybe that gave you a sense also that jazz is really international. It really, yeah. you know, it comes from America, but now it belongs to the world. Exactly. Yeah, it really opened my view of you know, how jazz has become universal language. And you know, there were musicians from Cuba, I remember, Israel, and all around the world performing uh, this music. So, uh, yeah, it was nice, even though... We don't speak, we might not understand each other, you know, with language, but in music, we, we play the same thing and we play jazz. So yeah, it really opened my mind. Yeah. So it was, it was a great experience. I appreciate that you say that also, that even though you didn't speak the same language when you were talking in conversation, when you were on the bandstand, you did speak the same language, which was the music. It reminds me that I had a very brief conversation about you with Larry Grenadier in 2015 when I ran into him in a hotel and he had just recorded on your first record. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I said to him, 
what is it like playing with Joey? I said, do you remember that he's only 10 years old when you're playing with him? Did you have any sense that you were playing with a kid as opposed to a more established yeah. musician? Well, you know, it's a good question, because like in the midst of it, no, I guess. You know, I'm just approaching it like, how can I make this sound better? So, yeah, no, it's, it's really not different, which is, you know, amazing for somebody who's not only 12, but has very little experience playing with other people. 11, 12 is super young. I mean, you know, I've seen cats 15, 16, you know. But this is like another... Some of it's different now with YouTube. You know, people have direct access to no matter where you live, you're going to hear, you can hear whatever you want. That's, that's new, yeah. right? So I think that, but still, to be able to reach that level just through YouTube, yeah. and, you know, CDs is really bizarre. I almost didn't want to think about it too much yeah. in the midst of it because I felt like this was just his special thing that he somehow figured out. Yes, yeah, exactly what. My good friend Larry Remedy says, you know, it's spot on. And that's, yeah, it's the same thing when I play with the first time I came into the studios and played with Larry. At that time, Larry and Ulysses. I never played with both of them. <laughs> uh, of course, I've known records and you know, they did, but, you know, it's different when once I play with the, the person in the live setting or in a recording session, when we play music, we are we equal. Yeah. And we play on the same level, basically, when we yeah. play music. But one thing that Larry did say at that time was that he could feel how you were still absorbing a lot of music. He said, I saw Joey, and then three months later, I saw him again, or whenever the next time he saw you was, and he said, I could tell that he had listened to all, he, it's like you had downloaded another artist or another you know generation of music he said you could you can feel it in his playing that he's still taking so much in because you were so young that you were a sponge you know you were still in the process of downloading music i think into your into your brain yeah i mean i'm grateful to have that experience and i think not just listening to music but getting to play with you know musicians like larry other amazing great musicians i play with you know like I can name a few, but <laughs> I also soak up their playing. Whatever it is, the way they compliment me or the way they react to to my playing, the uh, the spirit that they bring is, yeah, that's indescribable. And I also learn from that. I kind of observe that their energy and their experience. And that also inspires me to become a better musician. Yeah. How do you feel about having all of your work documented from the time you began? You know, many musicians have at least a small period of their creative development that they don't necessarily release publicly or that isn't something that you can find on YouTube. Maybe more and more now because musicians today are being raised with YouTube around them and social media they share. But your whole career from the day you began professionally will be documented. And so all of that development of your playing is there, and it's happened very quickly. But how is it for you when you go back and you listen to recordings of yourself as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old? Mm. Yeah, I guess. I never thought about that, actually. <laughs> now they ask me, I never thought about that, you know. And, but looking back, I guess things happen so quickly. And sometimes we forget to remember and appreciate also those uh, opportunities that I've had. Mm. I progress. And of course, I don't listen to much of the stuff that I did, like seven, even seven years ago. I try to kind of focus more on the present, the present moment. You know, I, I perform so much. I guess I stopped to think, you know, those, the things that I've done before, you know, being documented and just being seen by people at the, on a, at the early age. And sometimes it's, yeah, that's, I think that's important to, to have, to have the reflection on what, you know, the things that have created in music and the body of work that will hopefully inspire people yeah i think now i'm kind of 
focusing on what I can do better now yeah. and what I can bring my music to the world and how I can better connect with people. And it is always my goal is, you know, it's never ending. Yeah. Well, hopefully it will be a, a long time of that. You know, hopefully you have a long life to develop this career. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's always ongoing. Let's just continue to tell the story because it's incredible. At some point, Herbie Hancock heard you play. He's a UNESCO Goodwill ambassador. He's a real advocate for jazz as an international music. And he heard you play. Yeah, obviously Herbie never heard of me until Herbie saw me play <laughs> in Jakarta. He he hope he happened to visit Jakarta. I think he was also performing, I think the next year, I think he performed at, you know, the Java Jazz Festival. And uh, I was, of course, over the moon, as like everybody else. When I got the invitation to play for Herbie, I'm glad I get the chance to play for Herbie, not only to play for Herbie, but to meet Herbie was really, yeah. Uh, for me, it was the highlight. <laughs> I mean, he didn't say much, but he all he always smiled, which I always like. He always gave me this smile, and he was very encouraging. And I remember I played for him, a uh, watermelon man, and uh, he asked me, "What are you gonna play for me?" I said, "Watermelon man." Oh, oh, solo? Because <laughs> I played solo. Oh wow, this is a difficult job that you're doing playing solo because I remember he said that but he, he wished me all the best yeah so encouraging towards me and he, he always one thing I remember from Herbie he said keep playing don't stop you know, just keep playing and I remember he said that to me and yeah I thought that was very encouraging for a young person like me yeah, I mean, it sounds like in some ways that was enough encouragement for you that you said, okay, Herbie told me to keep playing, I will keep playing. If Herbie says it's okay for me to keep playing, then I should keep playing. Yeah, because it was, I won't say difficult, but the environment that I was in, you know, Jakarta is not really a place where you really make a living as a jazz musician, you know, unlike in New York City. And of course, there was really access to music education mm -hmm. like if you you know, in high school or whatever it is in the u.s they have you know like even public school we do music you know they have an outreach program and yeah all sorts of things anyway I, at least for me i didn't have that you know access but you know of course i have youtube you know, we all you know, listen to youtube and but I got to see some really good musicians, you know, live, you know, local musicians just to get me immerse myself to what it is to be a jazz musician is to play with people. And so, yeah, I guess I'm thankful I got to play with people, even though I didn't grow up mm. performing in the environment where, you know, there was a lot of jazz. But yeah, I'm thankful that I still got to perform. How important was YouTube for your early development? How important was it for you to have YouTube to see jazz? It was really helpful <laughs> because we don't get to see, because we've been talking about Herbie for a bit or Herbie or Chick, you know, we don't get to see them every year, at least in Indonesia. So on, on YouTube, I guess I get to see, you know, all different clips of these great musicians performing live or some recordings that I didn't know about, you know, because YouTube has all the kind of information. Do you think you would have become the same musician at such a young age if YouTube did not exist? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if without YouTube, the, the information that I got, and I guess it would be different. Maybe you're right. You know, it might be different if, if it were not for YouTube. This information that I had and so, yeah, I'm thankful that mm. you know, YouTube was kind of uh, a tour, a gateway to see, you know, music. It was, I think it was really instrumental, at least to me. Also, not only to listen, but to f help promote my music too, because uh, I guess that's the most important thing, actually, is that. 
just get the word out about yourself and of course you know people do lots of things on youtube but it, it can be used for the good uh you know something you know to do for a positive if you want to do something positive you know playing uh anyway i think youtube really helped me that's how winton discovered me is to youtube he saw me uh i was performing on midnight you know in this studio in indonesia and yeah so i think it's important too for musicians for people to to notice you or get to know you a little bit that's great that you mentioned that before we tell the story about how winton marsalis saw you playing on youtube i'm just curious how did you decide what you were interested in did you have a favorite piano player or a few favorite piano players uh i wouldn't say i choose but i guess whatever my dad was playing for me i also i just you know kind of let it sink in so whatever my dad was playing i was just enjoying it the music of course later on i started to ask questions you know, who's this artist what song and all those things yeah of course, one of the early artists, you know, like Tony's Monk, was really profound in my in development. Yes. And so I always loved Monk. And I got to, later on, I got to play his songs and really was inspired me to be to where I am today as jazz musicians. Duke Ellington, there were all the kinds of artists, Billy Holiday, some singers too inspired me. Uh, I got to know more songs, I guess, you know, by hearing uh, singers like Nat King Cole, Billy Holiday, and all those guys. Of course, Miles Davis. I don't want to stop right there because you know Miles kind of introduced me to a different kind of jazz. And so, yeah, I guess early on, those artists were the artists that I listened to. What do you think it is about Monk that is such a continuing source of inspiration for so many piano players? His approach to music is special. His compositions basically are just beautiful. <laughs> Not only his composition, but his, his use of space and how he uh, allows others to be in that space and also allow them to express themselves, which is something I have not seen in mm. the other musicians. Because everybody has his own way or approach to music, but Mark... I think he has a special way yeah. to connect with people to his music. Tell me about Morricone. One of the references that you list on this record oh. <laughs> as influencing you is Ennio Morricone. Tell me about the influence of Morricone on your on your writing. Well, not particularly on this album, but yes, his music is really. I consider him, you know, a source source of inspiration. Yeah, especially the Cinema Paradiso. I think that was my first introduction to his stuff. And yeah, it's just beautiful. Everything he does is just to perfection. What do you like to listen to now? Anything? Yeah, it depends what I'm feeling, the mood that I'm in. You know, it can be Maui Kone, it can be uh, John Mayer, of course. It was, uh, I like his stuff too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it depends. And of course, people like Bud Bacharach is yeah. also a great one. And uh, actually, Luto sang his song, uh, Bud Bacharach saw The House Is Not a Home. Yeah. And, I mean, Luther is just another one that the voice, the angelic voice, because, you know, a lot of artists really inspire me, even like sometimes I listen to Gary Paul. Like, yeah, he's great too. It's like one of my favorite singers. Yeah. I think now I'm starting to enjoy listening to singers. It gives me a different perspective. Do you think about doing a project with the singers? Uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would consider it. 
you told me that you, you saw musicians playing and you loved the way they were having a conversation with each other. You understood that this was a music that was a form of communication. Right. But not everybody, even as an adult, is able to hear into that music and understand automatically, oh, this is a grammar this is a vocabulary, and once I know this vocabulary, then I can start to say things with it, you know? And it sounds like you understood that naturally. That was maybe part of your gift was not only playing it, but was being able to hear it at a young age. Yeah, I guess I always relied on my ears more, because mostly my, the way I learned music was by hearing and playing with musicians. So I guess mostly uh, instinctive. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important like myself as a young musician or any other young musician to to take time to learn, you know, the language, the vocabulary of what they're playing. I think it's important. So Winton heard you playing Round Midnight, which speaks to a question I always had about you from the very beginning. When you made your first record and you opened your first record with Giant Steps and then you played Lush Life and Round Midnight, these are songs that many musicians are told are very difficult and that you maybe don't start with that. You know, maybe you wait for your second record before you play Giant Steps. And it, it seemed like it was a way of expressing and explaining how developed you were already. But I also sort of felt like maybe you didn't know that those were considered the really challenging songs. Maybe those were just the songs that you liked playing. Yeah, the selection at the time, yeah, I didn't think too much of why I played them. I just, yeah, I really, I really loved playing them. Yeah. But I was aware of the level of difficulty <laughs> it is to yeah. play you know, a Billy Strayhorn song and something like giant steps yeah uh of course i knew it's you know challenges and of course before coming into the session i always i always try to prepare myself for, for you know songs like that mm -hmm. so i was yeah pretty aware even at that time and it's, it's always important for us musicians to Whatever it is, because I remember even in, in back in Indonesia when before I do a jam session, I would always try to prepare myself, you know, what songs to play. It just get myself, you know, ready. The uh, preparation I think was important for me. And even though yeah, everybody knows the tune, but still, I wanted to give my take on it and see. You know, even though, but I, yeah, I was really aware musically, you know, how difficult it was. Hmm. But, you know, because as I played, you know, I didn't feel that it was difficult because I think if we keep saying to ourselves, oh, this is too hard. Otherwise, we, it becomes very mathematical. Uh, music should be more feeling. Yeah. So that's how I see it, you know, when I, when a music present before me, you know, whatever it is, God Midnight, Jan Steps, or even my favorite things. So it's, I always try to enjoy what that music is trying to say. I always try to have the understanding before I play something, the understanding what the song is trying to say and yeah. let it flow, let it just sink in. Do you think when you were 10 years old, did you have an understanding of what Lush Life was about? This is a song that is about a very adult subject. You know, at the heart of it is a very grown-up story. Romance is much Stifling those who strive I'll live a lush life In some small dive And there I'll be while I rot with the rest of those whose lives are lonely too. Well, when I first began to play the song, at first I didn't know what it was really about. You know, his kind of solitary life, you know, Billy Strayhorn is not coming out, you know, because during his time, you know, musicians, not accepting yes. you know of his 
sexuality. So of course I didn't understand it at that time, and how really there was some you know grim moments in the lyrics, which yeah. was of course is adult, and I didn't really think about it. I only thought about musical aspect of it, of how really this level of depth in the song and just beautiful melodies. That's why I always look for in the music, uh, beautiful songs, beautiful melodies, harmonies. I guess that's the thing that I'm always searching for. And so when I select songs like Lush Life or Monk, the, that sort of thing, I always look for those elements. And you did it again on your new record. Most of the songs on your new album are original, but you do this cover of a song that was made famous by Bonnie Raitt, which is unquestionably a beautiful song. And I'm so glad that you recorded it because, you know, I'm old enough that I remember when that record came out and I loved it so much ever since then. And it's like Lush Life. You you hear all of the, the potential in that melody when you play it as an instrumental like you do. Yeah, it's the same feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Bonnie Wade. When I first heard it, I thought, yeah, one day I'm going to, you know, play this song. <laughs> but by choosing that song also, what I think is cool, and maybe it took you this many records to arrive here, is that you can pull the repertoire from not only the sort of traditional quote-unquote jazz sources, but from pop music, from anything, you know, that you have the opportunity to make it yours and bring it into your context. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you liked it, <laughs> the version that I did. Uh, it just suited my sound, especially the trio that I had in mind. It really worked out with the trio format. And of course, on the album, you will hear, you know, Theo playing. Uh, he did outstanding. But for this cover song, I thought it really worked best with the trio sound. And yeah, yeah it really did. I know that you've made records before with guitar players and with saxophone players, but mm -hmm. because you are a piano player and people are so excited about your playing, having Theo Croker play trumpet, I think it's a very mature decision to make the statement on a record of your original arrangements and songs to say, I want you to hear these compositions and I want you to hear this music. And so sometimes it's going to be the trumpet that plays the melody or it takes the first solo. It doesn't have to only be about you as a piano player, it's about you as a band leader and you as a composer also. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just the thing you said that because on live shows, it was always kind of me being the center. But of course, it's always good to let others be part of that experience. And of course, having Theo kind of play the lead melody, having him play the melody instead of me was really interesting to let somebody else play my songs and let that interpreter tell the story, you know, to whatever instrument they're playing. It's, yeah, it's special. We have this sound, you know, we bond, we kind of form a sound together, but also individually to have somebody like Theo playing, you know, it was, yeah, it was really nice. It really worked organically. But you say it was strange at first because you're still a little bit used to being the one that plays the melody or at least plays it along with another instrument. Yeah. But, you know, once we played, it just felt, it just felt right. Yeah. And I always had in mind to have a quartet, a particular trumpet player. I always love trumpet, you know, because Miles Davis, you know, therefore he's the guy. And, Definitely, Theo possesses, you know, that mystic. I don't know if it's the yeah, right word, mystic, yeah. but also 
a very cool sound. Very contemporary sound. Yeah, that that uh, that is his own as well. He has that originality, and so yeah, that's why I decided. Oh, Thea was one of my favorite trumpet players, so I decided to reach him to social media and. And we've been friends through social media. I never really met Theo before I played with him. So this was the first time we played together uh, for this recording. And you put together a, a basically a, a working trio now. You have a, a kind of an active trio. And the bass player that you're working with is lives in D.C., right? Yeah, originally from Baltimore. But yes, he lives in D.C. Yeah, Chris Fun. Yeah, it was nice to have a touring band to record the the music and yeah i'm really glad uh, just the music that we have built together and to have my new compositions is yeah was really nice and this kind of the the direction that i'm heading to is to always kind of compose more music and so continuous is that you know the cycle of how the state where i am today and as i continue to compose my music and share my story to the music. Did you notice a difference? You, you're you working with uh, John Davis and Chris Fun, and having a working band when you go into the studio, is there a different kind of feeling if you've had a chance to work out the material with the same musicians on the stage before you go into the studio? Was it more like a feeling of a band recording? Yeah, it definitely felt like a band because we played a lot of music together you know actually before starting the session actually i didn't really get to perform mm. the music a lot but i remember i did this engagement in seattle and there was kind of i used that time period to really prepare the musicians because i played at jazz area i remember four nights and that's kind of the time I used to get the materials ready for before coming into the studios. So, yeah, it was a little bit of preparation. And, yeah, I'm glad it worked out. Hmm. And, of course, with Theo, we only rehearsed one time because we only had the studio for, well, two days. <laughs> so, yeah, the, there was not a lot of time to really prepare the music. Yeah, But, yeah, it really felt like a band because we played so much together. So I want to go back and hear the story, though, about Winton. He, he sees you play around midnight, and he was obviously very moved by seeing you play. He said some beautiful things about you, that you're his hero, mm -hmm. that you were an inspiration to him. He invited you to play at Jazz at Lincoln Center. Where in that process did you move to New York? You and your family made another big move from Jakarta to New York. Yes, that was a big move. But when uh, that time period, I mean, we haven't decided to move to the U.S. yet. I didn't know that I would have a career in in America in general. <laughs> but of course, performing at the gala really opened many doors for me to kind of open the way for me to really perform later on in America. Again, there's video of you performing at the gala you come out, Billy Crystal, who's a famous movie star, invites you out to the stage and you sit down. Yeah, that was great. Billy, really amazing person. And I like how the way he was interacting with the audience and he explained to the audience, as you see in the video, of how every time I perform music, it's always different. And it got people, you know, uh, laughed a bit, you know. <laughs> it was nice uh, energy that he brought to the gal and you know he's such a great host he, he really was you performed then you quickly got up off of the bench and started to walk off stage i mean you're really little and you start to leave and he says come back joey come back don't go joey don't go take it in joey don't go let yourself hear this audience take it in man take it and in and the audience is standing for you and he made you come back into come the back light out. And feel that wave of love from the audience and from the Joey band. Alexander. Do you remember what that felt like? Yeah, you've reminded me of how that felt like. <laughs> now looking back, yeah, that was yeah amazing to 
to receive the uh, encouragement because it's my first time performing for a New York audience of or any audience, you know, in that scale. It was really uh, amazing. Uh, it was great for him. I'm glad Billy called me back. <laughs> it kind of let it sink in a bit and just enjoy that moment. And I think from that day on, I, I really understand, you know, how to get better on that aspect, you know, stage presence. And yeah, I think Billy Crystal, <laughs> he was not trying to teach me, though, but I can see that he wanted me to really to let it sink in, enjoy the moment. It's something that's important to enjoy that moment. Now I feel like I'm more comfortable doing it. And whenever I play for people, I always remember that moment. <laughs> were you scared? Did you get stage fright at all when you were little? No, I didn't. I won't say I get stage, stage fright. But yeah, that night, I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. That's why I walked off the... Yeah. I walked off the piano. I said, oh, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, how did you learn how to speak English? When did you learn English? Uh, but we, we all watch movies, <laughs> see cartoons or those action movies you know, <laughs> that has English. But, uh, you know, my dad himself, he, he spoke English because he, he went to college here. Uh, I mean, sorry, New York City. Yeah. For business, actually. <laughs> in New York City back in the 90s. So my dad always spoke English. And so I kind of learned by speaking English to my dad was the first time I really interact. And of course, once I, you know, being in the U.S., the musicians that I, I got to play with, I started to learn more about English and learning, just learning how to talk with people because musically it's important to have that communication and have the understanding of what I wanted to express. So yeah, it was important for me to learn to speak English and I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I got the more I speak English, the more we have felt more comfortable expressing uh, my ideas. And what happened with school with you? I mean, you became a professional so young. Did you finish high school? Uh, well, as moving to the U.S., you know, I, most of the time I did homeschool. Yeah. So most of the teachers were basically my parents. Yeah. They were always my teachers ever since the beginning. But yeah, I, I did homeschool. I tried it. But now I'm kind of, you know, this life of being a musician, touring musician. And so kind of this is full time thing. You know, it's really a commitment. Yes. People don't know this, but it's a commitment just to be on the road, to travel. It's, uh, it's not easy. I hear how you are so grateful and so appreciative for the gift that you were given and for the opportunities that were given to you. I don't feel any anger or pain from you, but is there a part of you that wonders what a normal childhood, teenage years would have been like? I mean, you skipped a big part of growing up in order to devote yourself to this career. Yeah, it's a big responsibility, but I feel like I'm enjoying the life. And, you know, I still get to enjoy things that teenagers like me, even though I'm a, I have a career, but I get to enjoy the things that you know, other teenagers are doing. Uh, I guess I'm 20 now. I, I still think I'm a teenager. It's funny. <laughs> but uh, I feel like I'm enjoying it, you know, the life I'm living. And it's a beautiful thing, you know, to inspire people whenever they're feeling down and you know, once they come to my shows, you know, they feel uplifted. So I feel good about that. Everybody who plays music, they can relate to that. They all will say the same thing. Yeah. I understand age doesn't matter when you're playing music, like Larry said, like we talked about before. You know, when you're playing, it doesn't matter. But now you're getting to be the age where there are other musicians who are your age who are as accomplished as you are. You know, so you can start to play with people who have a similar level of communication on their instrument that you have and are also from your generation or your age. I like to think I'm not the only one, <laughs> but like, you know, the youngest or whatever people say about me. I just happened to start early. <laughs> just like Michael Jackson. You know, he, yeah. It wasn't easy for him. <laughs> but it look what you know by 
performing music has bring him to so many different places and has inspired generations. Do you see yourself as an ambassador? Yeah, I see myself as, uh, especially as being a young person to inspire young people like myself, you know, to uh, hopefully pick up an instrument or learning to play music in general. I hope I can be that voice. How was it for you to become a band leader? You know, you started out alone playing piano, and then you learned how to play with other people. And now you also have to kind of be in charge musically. You have, I mean, you let your musicians play. You want, you choose the musicians because you want them to have their identity in your music. But, you know, when it's your band, you ultimately have to decide how you want to run the band. Yeah. I mean, what was the process like to learn to be a band leader? Yeah, it, it really brings challenges for sure, being a leader. It wasn't easy, especially, I would say, it's being young and having musicians who have that years of playing. But, you know, at the same time, when we play music, we kind of have to be on the same page. And, yeah, it really brings challenges at first, but it was important for me to voice my ideas and my direction in music. And so it was important for me to express that to the musicians. And so, yeah, I think being a leader helped me a lot. Some musicians talk about how helpful it is in the development of becoming a leader to be a sideman, to work with other people as well, because you see what leadership looks like from other people and you can borrow things from them or, or not do the things that they do. Is there a part of you that would be interested in spending more time as a sideman or a collaborator in that way? I guess I want to say I'm always open to that idea, but I guess, yeah, I have an interesting path that I like to tell people yeah. that I didn't have to go to that you know, environment or that process of touring with other musicians. But I guess I have, as I said earlier, even back home, I really built up yeah. my material. And of course, right now I feel I have more uh, material to share and so that's why I always change positions hmm. even though I play the same music but I want to see what the musician can bring to the table Yeah, because everybody has its approach to music I won't say style but more of the uh, character to their music everybody can bring a character and that's what I like to see in my music. And that's why I always bring in all kinds of musicians like Eric Harlan, Kendrick Scott. Uh, of course, we talked about Larry Grenadier. All those musicians, I would bring in their sound to my music and they really help me. Yeah. But also, I inspire them Yeah. to my music. So yeah, it's, a, it's a, that mutual respect that we have for each other. And so, I understand my role because not at least for me as a young person, not a lot of people get to play you know, at big stages that I've played. I mean, it's a big responsibility. And of course, I take it seriously to make, to get, to make sure that music is right, you know, to make it right. Can you imagine being older? I mean, what, what, when you imagine getting older as an older jazz musician, because, you know, we all know what it was like to see you as a very young jazz musician, but if things go well, you'll be a very old jazz musician as well, or a very old musician as well. Can you imagine that? I don't like to think about that. At least I try to enjoy what I have today. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think that's what matters now. Joey Alexander, thank you for enjoying today with me. I really appreciate talking to you, and I'm such an admirer of your playing and a fan of your playing, and I love your new record, and I hope, that a lot of people get to hear it. And um, I wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you so much, Leo. Thanks for having me on your show. I'm happy we get to share a little bit of my story. And I always tell people when I share a piece of music, I like to have the audience have their stories in the music. And yeah, uh, please check it out. My new album, Continuance, will be out 
on November 3rd and the album continuance is, is inspired by places where I lived, you know, before it was New York City and now the move to Baltimore was this, you know, this move really leads to my creation of this album, which is a uh, continuance. Hmm. And so, yeah, I think that's kind of the story behind it. Uh, it was nice talking with you. Thanks for, again, having me on the show. There he was, my friends, Joey Alexander, a remarkable talent, a remarkable young man. I'll be back again in your headspace with another deep dive before you know it. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios' award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org slash studios.